Wow. Uh, well, thank you so much, Brooke. Uh, and thank you all for being here uh, in the weather. And I understand uh, we're competing with graduation and Mozart, Little Rock Film Festival. Uh, it was. I, I caught most of it on the way over here. Uh, uh, usually at this point, um, when you know the crowd is, is a little bigger and, and more impersonal, uh, there's a great agitation when everybody realizes that I'm not, it's not the real Dave Chappelle. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can all just quietly leave. Um, it won't hurt my feelings. Uh, it's the story of my life. Um, I uh, want to talk to you about uh, the new book from uh, Random House out in January, Waking from the Dream, The Struggle for Civil Rights uh, in the Shadow of Martin Luther King. Um, and I uh, want to put this here. Okay. No, flat surface. Um, I uh, actually am going to read you um, about, the, I think the first 10 or 11 minutes is um, a part of the book that didn't make the final cut. Um, so, so this is a, you know, an extra uh, added bonus, no, uh, no extra charge. Um, I want to talk about how people remember the civil rights struggle that um, Martin Luther King has come willy-nilly to symbolize. Um, and the book starts with uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King in April 1968. Um, and uh, it's in a sense, it's a, it's a biography of his ghost. Uh, what happens to his image and to America's understanding of uh, wrestling with what, what that stands for. He became a kind of synecdoche for the larger phenomenon uh, over the howls of protest of uh, virtually all scholars of the movement who wanted to emphasize it wasn't really about Dr. King, it wasn't about these big headline events and these national leaders, uh, it was really about the grassroots um, and that's, you know, so the ivory tower uh, love affair with the grassroots has been the main story of um, the history, the professionally written uh, scholarly history of the civil rights movement. Um, but I want to, I'm not going to really talk about that, about how you should be interested in the grassroots, uh, not much anyway. Um, I want to just poke at a couple of things that I think are wrongly remembered by professional scholars and, you know, otherwise responsible, diligent documentary filmmakers and TV producers who look back uh, on the movement. Um, and uh, the beginning of my story, the sort of the end of the civil rights movement or the perceived end of the civil rights movement with Martin Luther King's death is terribly misremembered, I believe. The main thing that the public and uh, many scholars seem to remember or think they remember about King's death were the riots that followed. There was significant upheaval in some major cities, but on the whole, I found, looking into it, uh, going back to the sources, the violence was actually much lower than many were expecting at the time. Newsweek magazine stated that the country was on the brink of all-out racial war a couple of days after King was shot. Uh, and uh, Newsweek was bracing itself for more. Uh, Time magazine said that the reaction to King's murder seemed to threaten the onslaught of race war. Eldridge Cleaver, the uh, Minister of Information of the Black Panthers, said that his contacts in the civil rights movement were now unanimous uh, 
that the war had actually begun. Holocaust, he said, is imminent. America will be painted red. Dead bodies will litter the streets for the failure of nonviolence had just been proven, you see. There had been hesitation and division before Cleaver, Cleaver went on. But now all black people in America have become Black Panthers in spirit. So there'd be no more nonviolent pleas for mercy. Now there is the gun and the bomb, dynamite and the knife, and they will be used liberally in America. America will bleed. America will suffer. And this was a very widely shared uh, opinion among activists who thought of themselves in the civil rights movement, in the larger freedom movement, if you will, um, who thought of themselves as, as more militant, more radical than King, in their eyes, was, was ever willing to be. But very widely, across the ideological spectrum, all generations and perspectives uh, anticipated another long, hot summer of riots, another long, hot summer like those of 1964, and especially 1965, 1966, and 1967. One after another, it seemed to get worse and worse, and people thought there would be no end to the rioting. And this event, this horrible event, caused people to just, you know, panic and overflow in grief and anger and uh, disappointment. Uh, they thought, you know, this is it. There's Armageddon. Uh, you know, we're really going to get what's coming to us or, you know, what we've most feared. Um, and to this day, and by the way, that, that long, hot summer had been predicted <laughs> uh, before King was shot, uh, and they were proleptically blaming King for uh, failing to calm people down and pull people back and, you know, accept the victories they'd already had as uh, sufficient. Um, and many people saw King as getting more radical and less responsible, even some of his erstwhile supporters. Um, to this day, many textbooks and re retrospective stories on King's assassination in, in the media remember a great upheaval, a great orgy of violence. Well, that is misleading. Uh, memory of the riots cuts short the rest of national memory for Americans at the time began correcting their memory within a week of the assassination. And they were correcting their memory, their anticipation, and the initial feeling that, oh my God, you know, the onslaught, the race war, Armageddon has begun. They began to correct that uh, within a week of the assassination uh, in white papers as well as black. For their experience, uh, of violence swiftly failed to live up to the hype. In fact, significant violence was confined to just four cities. There were deaths only in Chicago, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Kansas City. The emphasis in the first few days after the assassination in the reporting uh, was on violence in the streets and on urgent pleas for calm. But within a few days, Time Magazine and other news outlets could not make up their minds which was more astonishing, the destruction and death in a few cities or the strange lack of it in so many other cities. How to account for the widespread failures to burn, kill, and maim became a big question at the time, though that question seems to have died unanswered in American memory. Time Magazine's own tentative answer was the following. Swift action by authorities with the uh, conspicuous exceptions uh, like Chicago's Mayor Daley, Chicago, where I grew up, came in with the highest uh, total uh, riot deaths that season, uh, first place with uh, 11 or 12 riot deaths, depending on how you count. Uh, swift action by authorities, Time said, and restraint by police in direct confrontations kept the lid on most communities. And this was reflecting, as time and others notice, the lesson of the recently released Kerner Commission after Governor uh, Otto Kerner uh, was apported, uh, 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 appointed by uh, President Lyndon Johnson to investigate what people thought was you know, going to be this endless problem of uh, the inner cities exploding every summer. Um, had appointed a commission to investigate that, particularly after what we now know was the worst uh, season, 1967, turned out uh, also to be the last. 
the report was issued about a month before King's assassination. Of course, nobody, know, nobody knew um, the assassination would come, and, and they were absorbing it, and absorbing it with admirable uh, speed, uh, many observers um, observed, <laughs> what observers do. Um, and actually many had anticipated already, you know, the rumblings were out, people were already learning the lessons, uh, police chiefs, public safety commissioners and mayors uh, learned that strong police reactions tend to provoke and to exacerbate riots, not to squelch them or to deter them. Um, and that's, you know, the, the policies changed, except in uh, Mayor Daley's Chicago um, and uh, the mayor of Kansas City, Missouri, uh, later became, I'm sorry, the police chief in Kansas City later became head of the FBI, uh, drawing a blank on his name, um, Kelly. Uh, he was an exception. Um, and Spiro Agnew, many saw as the uh, sort of controlling authority in uh, Baltimore, a governor of uh, Maryland, uh, and then Washington uh, is another story. It's interesting that later Richard Nixon rewarded um, uh, Agnew with, of course, the vice presidential nomination and uh, the police chief of Kansas City uh, with the, the, uh, the FBI. He became, uh, he appointed him uh, director of the FBI when uh, J. Edgar Hoover finally uh, left the scene and, 1972. Uh, the Baltimore uh, Afro-American, uh, often seen as, as one of the great uh, African-American papers of, of the country, uh, took a similar view to uh, Time magazine. The week after its own lavish uh, riot coverage, which seemed to embarrass the paper uh, the, the following week, um, the Baltimore Afro-American uh, devoted itself to praising the police and other authorities generally for their restraint, um, even though that paper's own city, uh, Baltimore, was tied for last place uh, in riot deaths with, with six dead. The Afro editorialized, police, National Guardsmen, and federal troops don't deserve the abuse being heaped upon them. At least they don't deserve it now. They might have deserved that sort of thing last year and the year before, and indeed <laughs> through all previous history. Uh, but this time, these forces did not panic. Baltimore owes them a tremendous debt of gratitude, the point being that the casualties in Baltimore would, would have been much worse, could have been much worse, and that's what they were emphasizing now. The Afro even took the unusual view that we did not have a riot at all. And if you look at the argument, um, the Afro defined a riot as mass violence directed against persons, which is a historically sound definition of the you know, standard usage of the, of the term riot. Uh, though American riots after World War II deviated from that historic pan, uh, pattern and devoted more of their energy to destruction of property. A very important uh, distinction, in fact some uh, authorities were accused uh, or praised, depending on the perspective of the, uh, the observer, for pulling, out for pulling out police forces and letting the crowd have at, uh, you know, storefront windows um, and, you know, destroy property and loot and so on, because they, they reasoned that if they pulled the police forces out and let the sort of, you know, the steam run out of the beast, um, the, the, the damage would, would be limited, and um, that, that, that turned out, believe it or not, uh, the, the police were praised for, for doing that sort of thing, thinking that they sort of traded some damage to property for uh, saving lives and, and preventing injuries. Uh, major black newspapers in, in the two cities, the two other cities that witnessed uh, great violence, namely the Chicago Defender and the Kansas City Call, also adopted a calm, anti-alarmist editorial and reporting posture. And this was another big issue. The Kerner Commission had pointed to sensationalist media coverage as gasoline on the flames of uh, rioting. So there, this was maybe, you, you, you might suspect, a little exaggerated uh, or uh, purposeful. Um, 
the recoil from the initial uh, emphasis on the dangers of rioting. The Baltimore Afro's neighboring white liberal paper, the Washington Post, which was then in the process of integrating its uh, new staff and its editorial staff even, uh, took a strange pride in interpreting its city, which ranked number two uh, in total riot deaths with seven or eight uh, accounts differ. Uh, the Post emphasized the relative absence of personal violence, of open racial hostility in confrontations between whites and blacks, and of snarling defiance of police and soldiers. All over the country, black and white people on the streets had been quoted threatening violence in several cities where in fact there turned out to be none at all. By the end, the press uh, recorded 43 deaths nationwide, which is 43 too many, of course, but in perspective, this was a much smaller number than was widely feared at the time. Exactly that number, 43, were reported in Detroit alone in the previous year's season of riots. Uh, several major papers, black and white, ran long thumbsuckers about why certain places that were known for violence, Watts, Los Angeles, uh, had left 36 dead in 1965 and what people thought was, you know, that's really the, the point of no return. That was the first really big one. Um, and Newark, uh, which left 23 dead in 1967. Both Watts and Newark had no deaths or major injuries at all in 1968. Uh, Detroit, which again had 43 dead in 1967, and Harlem, which was seen as touching off the big wave of riots in 1964, uh, maybe the other ones that came later in 64 and the subsequent three years were, were sort of copycat or you know, inspired or uh, touched off uh, by the Harlem riot. Um, Detroit and Harlem didn't even make the list of minor disturbances in 1968. And the answer uh, that many authorities and uh, media outlets found was that militant figures like Leroy Jones uh, who was soon to remake himself as Amiri Baraka. Leroy Jones, uh, eminent uh, though uh, amateur in the best sense of the term, uh, jazz historian, uh, also a, a very prominent uh, poet and playwright in those years and, and had been out in the streets, uh, got arrested on a gun charge, was really, you know, calling for insurrection and, uh, and violence and, you know, all but threatening to to shoot people himself, um, actually went into the streets in his native Newark in April 68 after King was shot and pled with people to calm down, to go home, to, you know, to think about things. Charles 37X Kenyatta, uh, a big figure in Harlem, uh, Malcolm X's former bodyguard, then leading uh, a, a paramilitary group called the Harlem Mau Mau, after King was shot, walked through Harlem arm in arm with Republican Governor Nelson Rockefeller, urging people to maintain the, uh, maintain the peace. And uh, the same Charles 37X Kenyatta praised Republican Mayor uh, John Lindsay for his brave efforts to calm people down. The soul singer, I'm sure everybody remembers, uh, James Brown, uh, really a apolitical character um, but a symbol of uh, black is beautiful and I'm black and I'm proud and, you know, for a lot of people inspired a sense of um, pride and uh, defiance and refusal to, to conform. Um, Brown played a similar role in Boston where a concert of his was canceled in order to ward off a riot. They were afraid, the, the new mayor, uh, Kevin White, was afraid people were gonna go down to the uh, concert and get all you know, riled up and, and riot on their way home. So they, they canceled the concert, really made James Brown mad. He wanted his money. Um, and they had a negotiation and they agreed to put the thing on public TV uh, and tell people they'd get a full refund for their tickets. But some people came anyway. Some people did stay home because they were afraid uh, of the riots. And, you know, federal troops uh, were, were waiting uh, 
on uh, sort of red alert, uh, you know, sitting on their ru rucksacks with the, the bayonets in hand, watching public TV, watching James Brown with a very small crowd and, you know, telling them to calm down. A couple of times people jumped up on the stage. Um, there were many bootleg recordings of this available when I was working uh, on the book. Uh, I went to WGBH having seen in the sources that you know this was actually broadcast and people said oh yeah we didn't make tapes in those days and you know we just sort of taped them over again the next day and nobody thought about historical preservation but I got to a guy and he said well let's check and they went and dug it up and he said you know I got something here I think it is actually what you're looking for and you know nobody has since the concert happened nobody has opened this box and it's now actually turned into a documentary movie. I don't get any royalties or anything from my <laughs> discovery, but, um, but that was just a, a little neat thing that, that, that happened along the way. Uh, and it's quite a thing to see, really. I recommend it if you, it's a very, you know, they, they cleaned up the, the footage and edited it. Um, and then, because of what he had done in Boston, it seemed to, to work. You know, there was no riot. There, there, well, James Brown must have been the key to it. Um, the mayor of Washington, D.C., confusingly named Walter Washington, uh, urgently called Brown to get him to change his schedule and come down to, to calm the people down. Who It was one of the first outbreaks of violence was in D.C. It was the night King was shot, uh, within you know a couple of hours of his the announcement that he was, was dead. Um, uh, and he was given a great deal of credit for helping Walter Washington calm the crowds down. And although they had, again, uh, several deaths, uh, it could have been much worse, and Brown got a lot of credit for that. The Pittsburgh Courier, uh, rival of the Baltimore Afro for the role, like the leading uh, voice in, uh, in, in the African-American press, had a different theory, uh, leading its uh, post-riot, uh, you know, post-mortem. No riots hit race mayors, was the headline. No riots hit race mayors, meaning there had been no riot in Gary, Indiana, or Cleveland, Ohio, which cities uh, became the first major American cities to elect a black mayor in the fall of 1967. They were inaugurated in January 68, uh, uh, just under three months before King was shot. And like Kevin White, you know, they were in Boston, they were new. Kevin White was white, but he came in on the sort of new wave of, you know, meeting the young people where they were and uh, idealism and sympathy for the, for the poor and the anti-war people and whatnot. Um, uh, both of them, the theory, the sort of, you know, seat of the pants uh, instant theory of the Pist Pittsburgh Courier was didn't riot because now they have, you know, a person they can visibly identify with, somebody representing them actually in the city government and maybe didn't want to, you know, embarrass him or, you know, mess up his act uh, when he was just uh, getting going. That sort of discussion uh, proliferated. Uh, and the courier, I think, overcompensated a bit for over-reporting uh, and reacting with some alarmism in the initial blush of, uh, of coverage right after um, King's death. It managed, for example, to overlook Walter Washington's uh, Washington. It's a more complicated story. He wasn't really mayor. I mean, they called him mayor, but Washington was still a, a third, a third world colony with, uh, you know, taxation and no representation, which uh, it, it is today, of course. Though the mayor has a little bit more power, um, but and, and that was, he was, he became, you know, the head guy uh, before Stokes in Cleveland and uh, Hatcher and Gary. But, you know, so that they, you know, technically they could have not considered him a black mayor. They didn't mention it. And it, it ranked second, uh, again, with seven or eight uh, deaths Washington, D.C. did. And also, uh, more obviously, not only cities with black mayors, but many, many other cities also experienced no significant violence. The best answer to come to this question so far, I believe, I mean, what I think is, you know, we need to, <laughs> change our memory and look back and actually discuss what really happened. Um, but the best answer to the way the question was framed then did not come into public consciousness 
until 12 years later uh, in the voice of Andrew Young, who had been one of King's uh, lieutenants and uh, strategists uh, in the 50s and 60s. Been appointed by Jimmy Carter um, as UN ambassador. By 1980, when he says this, what I'm about to tell you, uh, he'd already been fired uh, by Jimmy Carter, remember, for, uh, you know, embracing uh, Yasser Arafat. Um, but Carter called him, and of course he, he said yes when the, when the violence broke out in Miami in 1980, and he went down there to try to figure out what had happened and try to uh, get people to calm down and you know, deal with the mess. And that was the first major urban disorder since 1968. Twelve people were killed in the Miami riot in 1980. What Young said was this, observing what happened in um, Miami in 1980, he says, I, don't, I think the problem's over. I don't think it's going to happen again. If you're what you're worried about is this becoming a pattern. What we learned back in the 1960s is no neighborhood riots twice. No neighborhood riots twice. People in the riot-torn neighborhood learn, he explained, that whatever they had wanted when they went out to burn and loot and rampage, they had ended up far worse off, worse off, worse enough off to stifle the impulse to riot next time. Poverty and other uh, conditions often worsened in poor neighborhoods in the 1970s and 80s, but large-scale rioting became extremely rare. There were no significant riots from 1968 to that one in 1980, and none from 1980 till the 1992 uh, LA, why can't we all just get along, riot. Uh, I'm sure you all remember in, uh, in LA in uh, 1992, which left 53 people dead. So looking back, uh, it appears to me that the most significant response to King's assassination was not the initially over-reported and over-remembered riots, and, and over-remembered today, over-reported initially, corrected, but somehow, you know, the sensationalist, alarmist coverage at the beginning is what lingers on in the textbooks and, you know, media retrospectives on what happened after King's assassination. What really uh, happened, the, the, the most significant reaction of the United States of America, I think, was not the over-reported and over-remembered riots, but the under-reported and under-remembered Civil Rights Act of 1968, which was signed into law a week after King's assassination, also known as the Fair Housing Act, the third of the three great civil rights acts of the decade, or really the third of the three great civil rights acts of the Second Reconstruction. Uh, the, 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 the run of uh, big successes that the African-American freedom struggle had in the age of Martin Luther King, um, outdoing or a sense giving flesh to the bones that had been uh, set up uh, in the first Civil Rights Act in 1866, which had become a dead letter, of course, until uh, King and all he represents burst out in the streets in the late 50s and 60s. Supporters of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 said that they wished to pay homage to King. And now I'm, I'm leaving behind the extra bonus uh, that, that, isn't, that didn't, you know, that was on the cutting room floor uh, of the book. And now some of what I'm going to tell you is actually in the book. Um, supporters of the Civil Rights Act of 68 said that they wished to pay homage to King and also to show rest of ghetto dwellers that hope was not lost. They were worried about the riots themselves. King had strongly supported the new civil rights bill for over two years before his death. He believed that the great civil rights acts of 1964 and 65, the ones that everybody remembers now, were just a long overdue beginning. Little more, did, they did little more than restore what was already supposed to have been established in the 14th and 15th amendments ratified in 1868 uh, and 1870 respectively, 
and that 1866 uh, Civil Rights Act, which because it was so widely abused and uh, ignored and um, dragged in the mud uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the states that were resisting Reconstruction in the first Reconstruction, uh, you know, that, that's what made the, uh, the 14th and 15th Amendments uh, necessary. Since King's uh, strategic shift to northern cities in 1965 and 66, King had been steadily losing hope of ever passing um, this new civil rights bill that, that the Johnson administration and, and many in Congress and around the country were pinning their hopes on, to something that was aimed specifically at poverty in uh, the big cities, especially in the North and West, shifting away from the South. Um, but by 1968, uh, really by 1967, after what was seen as a backlash election in 1966, King and others just really seemed to lose hope that Congress would ever muster uh, the will or the unity to pass this, you know, urgently needed third Civil Rights Act, third of the big ones of the 60s. Um, but then suddenly, when King died, the new Civil Rights Bill's prospects suddenly changed. Uh, the resulting major Civil Rights Act was not just a symbolic purge of emotion or a mere show of respect for the dead. It was a substantive answer to some of the Civil Rights Movement's most radical demands. And if King can be credited with any of the Civil Rights Movement's victories, it was his last real victory. Indeed, it was the only real victory that King could most plausibly take most of the credit for. King did not, of course, take credit, being dead, uh, but the point bears stressing. Again, the emphasis in historiography since the 1960s has been it's all about the grassroots. People like King aren't really the issue. They get more credit. You really want to understand things. It's bottom up. It's not top down. Um, but in this case, uh, Everybody, people who opposed it and people who supported it said that this bill was a response. Whoops, that's my, my mom, sorry. Uh, people, uh, people said this is, this is obviously a response to King's death and or to the rioting in the streets. Uh, indeed, I think one of the reasons that the act has been forgotten, at least the profession, at the professional level of, you know, the professional managers uh, of American memory, is that it's the one that, that can least plausibly be attributed to those uh, once unsung grassroots heroes and heroines of the struggle. Yet the Civil Rights Act of 1968 has been almost completely forgotten unlike the previous two major civil rights acts, which people reflexively attribute to King and the movement that he has come to symbolize. Give credit to the, the protesters in the streets at Birmingham and Selma particular, particularly for those getting passed, and everybody remembers the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. But um, before he died, King and other supporters of the new one, also known as the Fair Housing Act, highly doubted that any civil rights legislation could pass given the widespread reaction, and it was a reaction above all to those long hot summers of 65, 66, and 67. People have forgotten how controversial Martin Luther King was. He was one of the most widely feared and hated men in American history, and he was controversial within the black population. Not only black Muslims and black Panthers criticized him rather viciously, and not only mainstays of the old black bourgeoisie who had been carrying on a very different, quieter uh, struggle, people like Thurgood Marshall and uh, Roger Wilkins, who said things like he was a loose cannon and a king, a loose cannon and a messiah complex who just wants us to bail him out of jail when he gets in trouble. Uh, not only all that, but many of his own best friends and associates, the staff of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the board of the uh, SCLC, Many people he'd been relying on for support were telling him and telling one another 
recording in their diaries and their letters, sometimes saying to the press even that King had lost his way. They were strongly urging him to abandon the big demonstrations that he was planning to launch for the Poor People's Campaign uh, on April 22nd, 1968. And King himself worried, losing all this support, including financial support, um, worried that uh, he might have to call off those demonstrations, which he really wanted against all this counsel uh, to, to initiate and to, and to carry out. But he, he got so down in March 1968 that he said he thought the planned demonstrations in 1968 were doomed. Well, we know now that he was the one who was doomed uh, 18 days before the planned beginning of those great demonstrations uh, he would be dead. Before he died, King had drawn some encouragement from a Harris poll published in um, August 1967 at what turned out to be, though nobody knew it yet, uh, the worst and last of the long hot summers. The poll showed a majority of white Americans, as, New as Newsweek glossed the poll, are ready and willing to pay the price, meaning more taxes, for a massive federal onslaught on the root problems of the ghetto. How things have changed, you might say. Speaking to the Washington, D.C. Chamber of Commerce in early February 1968, King gave a hint as to why he was not following the advice of one of the most brilliant, uh, probably the most brilliant and important uh, strategist and confidant he had, uh, Bayard Rustin, who had a famous break with King in, the, um, in February of 1965. Um, Rustin had urged King to abandon protests and move toward politics. Now we've got, we're going to get the right to vote. The, the Voting Rights Act is going to pass. We've got, basically won our uh, legal rights have been restored. Now the thing is to get out of the streets, to roll up your sleeves, make the alliances, do the hard drudgery of, of, of using your new political power to make things happen that are going to actually matter to the people who've been left behind. Uh, King, King believed, you know, that you gotta, <laughs> that's diplomacy and no diplomat uh, operates effectively without military force. And the nonviolent army, you know, he didn't believe that Rustin was wrong. He said, we, yes, we gotta work within the system. We gotta roll up our sleeves and make alliances and form interest group coalitions and all of that stuff. Uh, but in order to give strength to that kind of diplomatic work, we got to keep the protests up because it's a minority, 12, 13 percent. He was trying to expand. The majority of poor people were, of course, then is now white. He's trying to bring them in, Native Americans, as we call them now, uh, Spanish surnamed people, um, et cetera, bringing them into a big coalition. Um, but he was uh, ultimately discouraged, and, and the main theme of his talk and uh, scribblings in those last months was, was like this. I don't have any faith in the whites in power responding in the right way. They'll throw us into concentration camps. The Wallaces and the Bircherites will take over. The sick people and the fascists will be strengthened, he said. The launching of the Poor People's Campaign in April 1968, he believed, in Washington, had to succeed to prove to the people who had been left out left out in the cold in uh, America's history of progress, could still get a hearing by nonviolent means. It was time to go all out, despite the criticisms, despite the abandonment of his fair weather friends and allies. We're going to plague con Congress, he said. We have to do that uh, because otherwise people are going to be destructive. And you know, they don't have the patience to wait for Rustin's strategy of working in the system uh, to, uh, to play out. I'm just going to um, give a little coda here and then uh, have, have plenty of time for questions, I hope. What, are we officially ending at like 7, 7.30? Seven. Well, we didn't really start until... All right, well, just, just, just one last thing. One, one index uh, of the depth and darkness of the memory hole into which the... Uh, the Civil Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act of uh, 1968 has fallen, is that 
people who opposed the Martin Luther King holiday later in, uh, began you know, to be considered in earnest in, uh, in 1979. There'd been some skirmishes about, in fact, James Brown had uh, asked Nixon to uh, declare a Martin Luther King holiday, and I have a really hilarious uh, story about that if you want to hear it. Um, but it began in earnest uh, in 1979, and it came that close to passing. In fact, it was really a, a parliamentary error and miscalculation on the part of the uh, supporters in Congress that kept the act from getting, the, the Martin Luther King holiday from being enacted when Jimmy Carter was president and the Democrats had a majority control of both houses of Congress. Um, instead, it was enacted in 1983 when Ronald Reagan was president and the Republicans had, had control of the Senate. Um, and that's an interesting story. Each, one of the chapters in my book uh, tells it in excruciating detail with full orchestration and four-part harmony, but the weird thing is that nobody in the debates that really went on for, for four years and fierce opposition, clever, resourceful opposition to the holiday, nobody said what would have been the best argument against it, which is, excuse me, but dude, we already paid tribute to Martin Luther King. We don't need a Martin Luther King holiday. Martin Luther King, some really clever conservatives in New Hampshire figured this out. They read about King. He didn't have a Messiah complex. He was, he was always saying, I'm just a poor sinner and I don't, I don't want you to, you know, I don't want you to talk about me. I want you to, you know, carry on the, carry on the work. Um, he resisted the, the cult of personality in his lifetime and, you know, logically would have afterwards. So we shouldn't have a King Holly. Well, they didn't just give a symbolic, you know, empty, tribute to King in his, in, in, in back in 1968, they gave him a substantive radical victory that he himself had gone to his death desiring and, and hoping for and had almost given up hope on. We've done that. We, Congress, rose to that occasion, <laughs> kicking and screaming, uh, but they did it. And that would have meant a lot more to Dr. King, and it would have been a very effective argument against the King holiday. Nobody made it because people don't remember. So you should remember, uh, and my book is a sort of like a, 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 a pill to help you uh, recover from uh, your amnesia and uh, you know, put it in the water and uh, see what you can do with it. Thank you for uh, listening to my story. And do I have to... Am I tethered to this thing? Does anybody even have any questions? Or? Tom. Charles Sherrod. Yeah, he's from uh, Georgia. But, yeah. Albany, Georgia. Yeah. Oh, I think that wasn't Charles Sherrod saying that, but... Uh, D David Van was was one that yeah 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 fascinating character. No, that's that's yet another guy. But David Van was a big supporter of the other the non Bull Connor that nobody remembers. Yeah. Yeah. Haynes, I think, was his name. Yeah. 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 And yet it seems to me that those images that came out of Birmingham did help change the tenor of, of how Americans thought about all this. Where, where do you come down on that? Uh, firmly in the middle of the fence. <laughs> Ow. It kind of it kind of hurts, but uh, I uh, I mean it's you know it's it's a classic historiographical question, isn't it? And, and you know, uh, uns unsolvable, irreconcilable, inadjudicable disagreement. Um, so most people would say today that the thought that King did have a thought of personality. That he, he delivered, or he sort of welcomed it, yeah. Mm, I don't, I think, I don't know. I mean, some people may think, I, I think that, 
I don't know any, you know, scholars who, who say that. There were people, and even then, I mean, his critics, the ones who knew him anyway, were saying that it's, it, it's not about him. He just, he can't help sucking all the oxygen out because the media just flocked to him. Um, and it's a problem, you know, in the age of, of mass mediated politics, I mean, people give the media a lot of credit for, sorry, Paul, uh, a lot of credit for um, the civil rights uh, gains that, that were made in those years because they put it on TV. And I think people would have said at the time that, you know, I mean, there really was a liberal media back then. I don't, you know, you hear the phrase now, but I think it was true to the extent that they were sympathetic. You know, they go to places like Birmingham and they talk to King and King's people and King's supporters, and they were welcome. And there's, there's some, some interesting work on Hank Klibanoff uh, won the Pulitzer for a, a book that, in, you know, explores this theme partly. So that's, that's one thing. Um, but, but people were hurt, and people were really, uh, not just in Birmingham, but all over. You know, King would come and get all this attention, and then when he'd leave, he'd go on someplace, you know, the law descends and then, and then moves off. And it really did bother a lot of people who were organizing at the grassroots level. And much of the resentment that came in, in you know, within the movement What's interesting is I think mostly the media being sympathetic and ironically being racist conveyed the image that black people were, you know, black people were all behind Martin Luther King and they were much more unified than they ever really were. And that helped. I mean, I think it gave people this, scared them or impressed them in some way that they thought that, you know, this guy that everybody is just you know, so in tune with and he's such an eloquent, charismatic character I think it really helped if you believe that story that the media and public opinion, meaning northern white liberal opinion, really swayed the country it, uh, as a you know outburst of conscience in reaction to these horrible images of the dogs and the fire hoses and so on. If you believe that story, then the media do play an absolutely uh, central role. If you believe the grassroots story, the media are you know are part of the problem. And for precisely the reason that you bring up, the grassroots organizers, it wasn't just that those other people were getting credit, but they, they were in fact undermining in some way uh, the hard drudgery that had to go on day to day. When all the excitement goes, you know, King comes to town, everybody gets riled up and they participate and we think we got a great movement and then he leaves and nobody's interested in it anymore. And that, that could be a real uh, problem. Now, obviously a hard choice because you want the energy a lot of them did. And I think even some of his greatest critics, Stokely Carmichael, uh, John A. Williams, are people who really, you know, really got to be bugged by that. Um, they would give him a lot of credit. They said, when he came to town, we were pretty darn unified. And when they asked Stokely Carmichael, you know, he'd go around in Mississippi trying to get these old ladies to register to vote. And, and they go, yeah, are you one of Dr. King's men? And he'd just go, yes, ma'am, I am. <laughs> and he, you know, he, he confessed that. He says, you just, you can't do other than that. And then you could get to talking to them and talk about, you know, you don't have to wait for the Messiah to come along. You can be your own. And then, well, we want to know, but, you know. Anyway, what do you do? And this, I think, is really interesting. Historians ought to be talking about it. What do you do when people at the grassroots themselves have a great man theory of history? I interviewed the head of the uh, transportation committee of the Montgomery bus boycott in her, in her home in Montgomery many, many years after the fact. And I you know, got to the end, I said, well, well you know, why, why did this, it was so exciting, so, uh, so many things happening then, why, what, what was different about that? She, she looks at me like, oh, you wanna talk about that? We were talking about all these logistical you know, details and stuff. You want to talk about that? Oh, why didn't you ask me? Be because God sent us that man. I said, y you mean Dr. King? She said, yeah. And you know, until he sees fit to send us another one, we're not, we're not going to get, we're not going to move another step. Well, I don't know. I mean, a lot of a lot of the religious scholars who look at the movement really embrace that great grassroots thing. It's the, it's the congregation. It's the, it's the pew, not the pulpit, that they want to direct your attention to, young man. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, you told me your name. Please tell me again. Sally. Sally. 
Well, I think as alive as it ever was, um, a lot of questions there. I don't, just to deal with the, the unpleasant part of it, I don't believe anybody really attributes the lack of rioting. Even Andrew Young, it was just, you know, you have a riot and you go, oops, that was a dumb idea. Um, that's Andrew Young's analysis. It's not that they, they positively found, you know, a nonviolent method of, of achieving uh, their goals. In fact, Rustin was very bitter about that. He said, what's actually happening? And one of the reasons he wanted to call off protests is because he believed that it was, it was, they were getting a response to riots. They really were. And if you want to teach people that the way to go forward is to agitate nonviolently, and, and this much King agreed with Rustin on. Rustin was a, you know, nonviolent, you know, expert. I mean, he was deeply schooled and trained in that, and he came to King to try to say, hey, you know, people have actually thought about this stuff and experimented with it, and, you know, King, King didn't, King knew, knew more than people gave him credit for, but he, he needed that and recognized that he needed Rustin and others from, you know, nonviolent organizations who'd been at it for a long time. But King thought that the, the real danger was that, that the authorities, the system, would actually reward violence. And, and Rustin said, that's what's happening. That's the irony here. They, they're not responding to King's kind of protests. That, 19, you know, after the Voting Rights Act was passed, they do respond to riots. They get attention. The media certainly respond. Uh, and often that's what people in the streets said they wanted, you know. We just want people to, to know how we feel. Uh, no, <laughs> I, I uh, that, that's uh, well done, but uh, no, I, I think it did. Nonviolence generally, nonviolent mass coercion compelled uh, the enemies of the movement in the South and in the national state to give up against their will. I do think that that happened. I think that's, uh, it's not the only story. The, the, the legal stuff that Charles Houston and uh, Thurgood Marshall led is, is crucial. Uh, the imbalance in the party system caused by masses of African Americans voting with their feet to get out of the South where they couldn't vote, they might have, the vote might not have been the reason they left, but by crossing borders into northern states or parts of the South uh, where voting rights were granted or respected a little bit more, or, you know, industrialized cities, um, by crossing those borders, they enfranchised themselves. And that destabilized uh, the competition between the two parties, and the Democrats suddenly found, beginning with Harry Truman and people like him in big cities, in the 30s and 40s, that if you, just the way you did with immigrant populations who came in earlier, you bid for their vote, you can get them. Doesn't matter that that's the party of Lincoln. Now Franklin Roosevelt's doing all this wonderful stuff. That's all important, too. The, the, the Congress was susceptible to, to being pushed, to being pressured, and then they were competing for allies in the newly independent states of Africa and Asia. And it was embarrassing that these diplomats from these new, these dark-skinned diplomats were uh, taken doing what diplomats do. They get in the car with the kids and they go down to Virginia Beach for a vacation and they want to get a, you know, a burger at the Howard Johnson's or something and they're in Jim Crow states and, you know, that's blowing up in the Eisenhower and Kennedy administration's State Department. It's a terrible problem. All that is really important too, but I think those, the nonviolent coercion that King and Rustin and others, you know, organized and led was absolutely central to the process. I don't think you can explain what happened without that. But I think that King and the others would agree. In fact, I mean, King's quite clear about it. There's never going to be all that many people who are devoted to nonviolence. You can sell enough of the people, enough of the time to get them to sort of go along. They even got the militants to go along for a while. You know, just come on, just try it one last time. Just maintain the discipline in this march. Don't break anything. Don't, you know, just maintain ranks. Be nonviolent. And, you know, people would provisionally do it. But the disciplined, you know, serious people who really believed either in nonviolent strategy or in a nonviolent way of life, and that's an overdrawn distinction in my opinion, but um, they're never going to be a mass movement. They never are. They never were. 
bedeviled Gandhi, too. He couldn't keep him in line. He tried. I think that's still important, but the, the conjunction of that strategy with circumstances that, for example, were very different from South Africa, roughly the same time period, put a nonviolent strategy, it just, it was a perfect uh, design for, for a nonviolent strategy to work. Nelson Mandela and others who, you know, were in a Gandhian movement uh, since the second decade of the 20th century, not Mandela himself, but you know, there, there had, you know, Gandhi had been there and set this thing up. They abandoned nonviolence. Uh, that, that's really what made Nelson Mandela famous. He led the, you know, the spirit of the nation, the Umkonto Away Sizwe. Nonviolence isn't going to work. Violence will work. We are not a minority here. We're the vast majority of people. We, the, the, the dark skinned people, the Africans. We have borders that allow us uh, refuge, uh, safe havens uh, over the border. We have uh, external sources of weaponry. None of that is remotely close to possible for African Americans in the South in the 1950s or you know, to this day. They're, uh, um, even if they were unified and disciplined and trained, violence is suicide. And that's the argument that made it, that King used and others used to make it a mass movement. And they understood he himself had to be more serious and more disciplined just to sort of simplify things as a leader. He had to have absolute nonviolent discipline, because otherwise people would get confused. He got rid of the gun that he kept in his house from talking to people like Rustin and Glenn Smiley, who came down from the Fellowship of Reconciliation. None of that's in my book, by the way. That's all nice uh, background, but thanks for asking me about my book. It, it, uh, wait, it starts with a V? Has an I? Two eyes. Vanessa, yeah. like I said, yeah. Uh, all right. Um, well, he wanted his money, and he was really mad, and they had to they had to guarantee him. He's talking to Kevin White, and I forget he had a. Uh, there was a young black city councilman who was very closely allied with Kevin White. Um, and he, he had been a law student at Mel King. Do you, do you remember? You must remember these folks. These are all your friends, <laughs> people you know. Mel King in Boston. Um, anyway, uh, they they had a negotiation, and he, you know, he wanted his money, and he had to have a guarantee that he was going to get the full box office receipts. And now the 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 promoters and the 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 concert hall don't want don't want that if they're you know having to refund all these tickets. They worked something out. They did a broadcast on TV. Um, and if you, if you watch, it's really funny. He, he had been really mad at Kevin White, but he invites Kevin White out on the stage at the concert and says, and Kevin White comes out and makes this really nice political speech. King hard, uh, James Brown himself hardly ever mentions Martin Luther King. He does at one point. Um, but he, he brings Kevin White out on stage to say, he, and he, you know, White makes this great political speech and, and goes off, and he gets a big, big round of applause. And, the, and John says, "He's a real, he's a real swinging cat, ladies and gentlemen." Like he didn't even like know his name. He's, you know, thank you, thank you. And, and uh, he he lectured these little kids. Uh, he you know, in some, I mean, he grew up poor in uh, Macon, Georgia. Uh, and been in prison and all this stuff, and he he believed in he, he believed in what he called green power. I mean, in a, in a way, he has a sort of profile, or speaks the language of the the black capitalists who were emerging. I mean, he owned a radio station, and the Nixon administration was going to become very interested in these people, which is why he ended up meeting with Nixon. In fact, he sung "I'm Black and I'm Proud" at Nixon's inauguration, which may strike you as weird. But in his autobiography, uh, Brown tells a story. You know the song, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. There's, he goes, Say It Loud. And then there's this chorus of children saying, I'm Black and I'm Proud. Uh, and I can't do justice to it. I mean, it's a, it's a very important and beautiful uh, piece of work and, and also, you know, a, a kind of glimpse of, of what was happening. Um, he went out, they said, he was such a perfectionist in the studio, you know, 
uh, really meticulous. You know, he'd find people for having a shoelace out of place and missing a, you know, one note. Um, and they were working on the song in the studio, and they had this choir from, you know, a local, I don't know, AME or Baptist church, I don't know what, but, you know, young African-American kids. And since they were all proper good church kids, their parents said, you know, you can't keep, you know, they got to come home and do their homework, you know, forget about it. So they're like at two in the morning or something, they go out on the street, and I kid you not, they, they go to a Denny's restaurant, and they find a bunch of kids who are like, you know, shouldn't be out. And they uh, bring them into the studio and, and have them, you know, rehearse a couple of times. And they're the ones who end up singing on black. And, and Brown, this is his own testimony, his own words. The funny thing is most of them are white or Asian. Because, you know, the black kids were from good homes and had to, they, they couldn't be in the studio that late. Um, he sits down with Nixon. I think it was in 1972. Two. I have the date. I think I got the footnotes somewhere in there. Um, this is in the Nixon tapes that were uh, really that this what Dick Gregory said. You got You gotta love Richard Nixon. He was a, a beautiful cat. Uh, the dude was so paranoid. He tapped his own phone. Uh, <laughs> So this is all on tape. You got Haldeman and Ehrlichman and you know John Mitch. I don't know who all sitting in the room trying to sound hip. You know, talking to James Brown with 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 Nixon. And it's it's just it's, it's. You think you're laughing now? You ought to actually hear. It. I mean, check it out. Um, and and you know Brown has nothing to ask him. He says, Well, you know, there is just just one thing, Miss Miss President. You know, I, I really think we ought to have a a holiday for Dr. King. And oh yes, I think that's a that's a wonderful idea. Yes, uh, um, but you know, I uh, I don't think I want to do it right now because, uh, well, you know, if I did it now, people would because the election was coming up later that year. So, they said, if I did it now, then um, you know, people would people would think I was just doing it for for political reasons, and uh, he sorry, he he wouldn't want that. Meaning, you know, Dr. King wouldn't want that. Uh, so that's why we didn't have a a Martin Luther King holiday in 1972. Then he gets in trouble with all that Watergate stuff, and you know, that's the end of it. But it's, I really recommend it for your, you know, for your listening pleasure. It's, uh, you know, they, they can't make this stuff up. And what's the movie, the documentary that came uh, You know, I got it. It's something like James Brown at, in, James Brown in Boston or something. You, you, if you looked it up, um, you can go if you want. You can go to the WGBH archives now, you know, thanks to me, and hear the actual footage and sit there and watch it. And, and as I say, there are a bunch of bootlegs out there if you want to just hear the audio. It's all, in fact, everyone that I can find just terrible quality, as is the original stuff at WGBH. But they did what, you know, these people can do. They, they, they doctored it and they cleaned it up so you can actually decipher a lot that you couldn't in the raw footage. So it, it turns out to be a very exciting thing. Tom, yeah. Uh, you talk about you talk about the night you think the interpretation has gotten it wrong since King's death. And I think I may have read some grants from some folks. Where did the traditional interpretation get it wrong in these teen years? About King, about the movement in the teen years. Uh well, you know, I, I think I think King is important. I just I I mean I don't really disagree that the grassroots are important. I mean, who could disagree? You listen to King, he says so. Uh, it's a funny, you know, David Garrow, who devotes uh, 750 pages to writing this meticulous, exhaustive biography of King, ends on this note, you know, well, it wasn't, you know, Dr. King wasn't really as important as I've led you to believe over the last, you know, 750 pages of agonizing detail. Re just read the last page, it's, it's funny. Because that's so, so deeply ingrained is, is the orthodoxy that this is all about, you know, the grassroots. I don't really disagree with that. It's, it's, you know, like, I mean, you have a conductor and you have an orchestra. And I don't think that, and that woman that I told you about that I talked to, she doesn't feel it's any insult to her. She doesn't feel it takes anything away from what she did to honor Dr. King. I think, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, make it, the, the funeral oration in the, in the uh, 
in the uh, in the Iliad. You know, they're 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 heaping glory on this guy who maybe was their rival, but but that doesn't diminish them. You know, they find. I, I just don't think that it it it's that simple. And Alden Morris wrote a, a sociologist wrote a pretty good book. So, you know, charisma is actually has has always been understood as a reciprocal relationship. It's certainly the way, you know, black folks in black congregations experience it. And if it's you go back, Stephen Hahn wrote about this in, in Reconstruction, illiterate people who have no hope or no imagination that they can sit in the state legislature or serve in Congress really identify with their leader. And you know, this is like a, it's a non-Anglo-American idea, but it's a universally understood idea. Leonard Krieger, a great historian, wrote a book in the 1950s called The German Idea of Freedom. And it's the same thing. Their freedom was encapsulated in a prince. And they felt, you know, that, that the prince's freedom, the prince's independence, was, it wasn't, you know, quite vicarious, but it, it, it's just, it's a complicated human relationship, and I just don't think, if you, just, you know, the hammer hits the anvil, every book you read, I mean, it doesn't bother you guys, you don't, I have to read them all, and they all, they have, they have, they have made other points, but the point that they emphasize and belabor, and have been, since, since 1980, when the you know, first generation of really serious historical scholarship starts, that's what they've said. Then they, you know, there's other themes, like, oh, the Cold War is important. Yeah, you know, that was an emphasis. We got three or four books on that. 97 books every year saying it's the grassroots. And you know, it's like, who's, wh where's the fight? You know, nobody disagrees with this. That's my humble opinion. All right. Now we get to drink. Yeah. But the cameras are gone. We can do whatever we want. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you.